Welcome to Behind the Numbers, the show where we dig a little bit deeper to understand what really matters most in business. I'm your host, Dave Bookbinder. I'm a senior director at Pine Hill Group. Today, I have a very special guest. I'm pleased to welcome Nick Baer, CEO of Saxby's. Nick, thanks for being on the program. Thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, it's my pleasure. So when I think about an entrepreneur, successes, failures, they, they go hand in hand, right? Yep. Your tale is a, is a great one, and we're going to jump into the successes in a little bit, but why don't you tell the audience a little bit about who you are and, and some of your entrepreneurial journey, if you would. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is. I mean, entrepreneurship is a, is a tremendous roller coaster. I thought for many years that my story was unique and that there were as many downs as there were ups. And the more that I've met other entrepreneurs and studied entrepreneurship, the more that I realized it's actually a pretty normal uh, case for me. But you know, I, I think I started to realize uh, when I was going to college that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. You know, my, my parents were, were young when they had me, didn't get an education, pretty much took whatever job that they could get. And a bunch of years later, they don't feel like their work is fulfilling to them. You know, and so I grew up in sort of that environment for 18 years, and I never wanted to feel the same way about work. You know, and so I was the first person in my family to go away to college, and that was life-changing for me because I got to meet a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of people who loved what they did for work, what their parents did for work, and I knew that that's what I wanted to be able to do. But, at, you know, I took a bunch of different internships in college all around the, uh, around the country trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to do, and by the time I was 22, I realized I wanted to create something. You know, I wanted to make a difference in this world, and I wanted to do it through business. You know, I, I could have started a nonprofit. I could have gone work for a nonprofit. Like I wanted to be able to make social impact, but I wanted to do it through the competitive nature of, of starting and running a business. And you know, people you know often ask, like, did you just like fall in love with coffee when you and your teens? I said, no, I actually didn't drink coffee when I was in my teens. But um, I loved the coffee business because it is the most inclusive business in any industry. And essentially what I mean by that is that any and everybody can come into and be treated with dignity and respect in a Saxby's, and we can employ any and everybody as well. So we have people with PhDs in our company, and we have people who have dropped out of high school. And they can not only have great jobs, but they can turn those into careers. And you know, I live in Center City, Philadelphia, where we have many of our locations, and, and it's not uncommon for people to be sitting in one of our cafes where someone makes a lot of money in a really high-powered job, and a table next to them, there's somebody who might have slept sadly underneath a, a bridge the night before, and someone gave them $2 to be able to go into a place like Saxby's and be treated with that, that dignity and respect. And that's why I wanted to go into the coffee business, is because it's, it's an incredibly inclusive business from both a guest as well as from an employment perspective. Yeah, great story. And one of the keys to your success, is, as we've discussed previously, is the, the engagement of your employees. It's creating a corporate culture. Talk a little yeah. bit about that. Why that matters? You know, I, I, it, was, it took me some time to, to learn that, Dave. You know, I knew why I wanted to create a business. Like, I wanted to show up every single day and be like, I'm grateful for this opportunity. I love what I do. But I didn't have the business education. I certainly didn't have the entrepreneurial experience to realize that creating a company culture and talent being your greatest, greatest asset could be your difference maker. I thought you had to create this like really amazing cup of coffee, sell a lot of it, and then eventually invest it into your culture. And I did that for a really long time at Saxby's. And, and I was asked to go back to my alma mater of Cornell and be an entrepreneur in residence in, the, in their like very world famous hospitality program where for many years I probably learned more than I actually taught. But I learned there that company, yeah, the, the organizations that have great company culture, those that attract the best talent, retain the best talent, and people are bound by this, this set of values, those are the companies that win marathons. You know, it's not about winning a race, it's not about having one good year. Can you have 10 good years? Can you have 100 good years? Can the business move forward when Nick Bayer retires? Can it get better when Nick Bayer retires? Culture is what allows people to move forward. And I fell in love with that idea, and I realized that we needed to sort of rebuild Zaxby's. And so at that time, we were six years in operation, we finally wrote our mission statement. We finally wrote our core values. And more importantly, we went person by person throughout the organization and determined, is this the business that you want to be a part of? And if it is, let's get to work. And if it's not, no harm in that. But Saxby's probably isn't the right place for you. So we had to go through that process for a long time. And then as we started to add new people, the, the barrier that we put up were, are you a culture fit? do the things that we believe in, make life better is our mission statement, you know, um, embrace being odd, outgoing, detail-oriented, and discipline, are these things that make your heart race? Not just like, oh, that's pretty cool, but does it make your heart race? Is that what you want to do? Because if it is, then you'll feel like I feel every day, which is that you don't work a day in your life. Like, this is what I do yeah. for a living. I get to talk about the hard work that 750 people that work at Saxby's do. We take care of 15,000 guests every single day, and I believe the great majority, if not all of them, 
love what they do because there's this, this great connection to the culture that we've created at Zaxby's. Yeah, no question. And you've yeah. seen the results of what happens when you get intentional about culture and how that drives top line, bottom line, engagement, absenteeism, turnover, right? All uh, those things? Everything. I mean, I, I, I look back on it now and the company that Saxby's was prior to having this culture was mediocre at best, at best. The company that we are today, despite the fact that we compete in such an incredibly competitive industry, not, not just all the great coffee companies, but you can go into you know, gas stations and they serve pretty decent coffee these days. We're in such an incredibly competitive business. You better do something more than just have great product. And I think that, that great product that we have is the talent that we have at Saxby's. And, and therefore, once we really embrace our culture and take it so seriously in the little decisions and the big decisions and everything in between, the company has taken off. We've grown immensely. We've attracted and retained talent. You know, we've won all these awards. We continue to grow. We created our, our you know, innovative experiential learning program. All the metrics, you know, the soft metrics, the hard metrics that you want to use to evaluate your business, every one of them is significantly stronger than, than it was before we had our defined culture. Yeah, and I know you're a big believer in the idea of putting your employees first, and they'll take care of the rest. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge believer in that. I mean, we, we've all heard the adage that, like, the customer always comes first, and and I, I, we're not believers of that. Um, simply that, you know, we can't take care of customers or what we call guests if we don't have people, great talent that believe in Zaxby's, but more importantly, naturally want to take care of people. Yeah. It, it, like, I've tried and I, I'm either just incapable of doing it or it's just not capable of being done, but you take someone who wakes up in the morning, kicks their cat, says something mean to their roommate, is mean to the bus driver, and then all of a sudden you expect them to like, put on a smile and take care of guests naturally every day. I just don't know that it happens. And so we work so hard. Like we have an incredible recruiting department and an incre you know, incredible training department where we put up a lot of barriers to people before they actually can go out and serve guests. And the biggest barrier that we're focused on is, are you naturally someone who likes taking care of people? I truly believe that the best feeling that exists is doing something nice for somebody else. Yeah. You can go out and buy yourself a nice blazer. I'm sure I loved this blazer the first day I bought it. I love it a whole lot less today. But if I do something nice for someone today, that feeling gets better as the day goes forward. To see that someone you know, have a smile on their face, knowing that that made an impact and that they're going to probably go out and want to do something nice for somebody else, that feeling is the strongest feeling. And so we look for people who have that naturally in them, and then we really encourage them to just do it. Do it hundreds of times a day with your team members, with your guests. Go out there and do it, and you're going to really love what you do. Well, that really resonates. Only, I know we only have a couple more minutes in this first segment, but if someone wants to learn more about you or Saxby's, what's the best way to learn more and contact you? You know, a, a lot of ways. I mean, I think one of the things that we've, we've uh, really focused on right now is social media. So I'm, I'm pretty active on social media. I love LinkedIn. I really wish I had LinkedIn when I was an 18-year-old, when I was a 22-year-old, because I think it's a tremendous way. Like, you, we were all trained to like, ask for people's business cards. But if I get Dave's business card, all I have is information on Dave. When people connect with me on LinkedIn, they, my entire connection platform is their connection platform. Yeah, there's a great way for me to be able to do that. And, and we share a lot of information there. And I'm, I'm also active on Twitter, which I think is, is the, the, you know, an amazing way to be able to get news. It's like my, my digital newspaper. Um, so Nick Bayer at, at both LinkedIn and, and Twitter, and then Nick Bayer 6 on Instagram. Instagram is sort of my way of being able to share like the behind the scenes of my life, you know, the 24-7, 365 of, yeah. of being an entrepreneur. Very good. I'm going to try and squeeze in one more quick subject here before we have to break. Social impact. I yep. know you're big in giving back and philanthropy. Talk yep. a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is, is sort of that early, you know, the, the early upbringing for me. When I was graduating college and was having, like, my midlife crisis at 22, I'm like, what the heck is it that I want to do? I kept coming back to a couple key things in my life. You know, one, I had parents who, despite not loving what they were doing for a living, went out of their way to make sure that they could change the trajectory of my life from theirs. You know, and so they really focused on education. And I had a couple coaches and teachers, both in middle school and then high school, who just went way above and beyond to sometimes grab my hand and lead me in the right direction and sometimes kick me in the butt and move me in another direction. And I got to, you know, I, re I connected, I stayed connected with them and rebuilt relationships with them when I graduated college. And I got to hear how proud they were to see me go and build a success of my life. And like, that's the kind of thing that I want to do, you know? And I'm, I'm a former athlete, and I love competition, so I wanted the competition of business, but I truly believed that I could make social impact within the business space, that those things didn't have to be mutually exclusive. You didn't have to build this really successful business, and then eventually, the talent of your career started donating money. I feel like if I 
be to build that into our business, I would not only love what I did, but I could track more and more people. And Saxby's at 750 people is way better than just Nick Bayer doing it on its own. And so we built social impact at the core of what we do. We, we like to call it being a double impact company. Every for-profit business needs to be financial impact oriented, but it's not good enough to just be financial impact oriented. What if you can also be environmentally, societally, you know, from a governance perspective, what we call sort of a social impact, like that we're a social impact company, you do those at one and the same. So every decision that we make at Saxby's, we truly try to take social impact on equal footing with financial impact. And I think what we're proving is that when you do that, you're not only gonna make bigger social impact, you're gonna make bigger financial impact as well. It's not just doing well, but it's doing well and doing good sort of at the, at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's all connected, right? So when you talk about getting the, the right fit employees who buy into your culture, your vision, social impact is a part of it too, because my belief is that people, regardless of their age, not just millennials, want to be part of something that's a bigger mission. It's not just about going in, doing a job, you know, crunching a spreadsheet, you know, serving a cup of coffee, for example. No, I mean, I, I think that it's, if, if you want to survive and God forbid thrive in business today, you have to embrace these things. I just truly believe that it was, it was sort of innate in me based in my own upbringing that I wanted to be able to do this. But even if you don't believe, even, even if you don't personally believe in it, you better embrace it in business because if you look at like the millennials, you look at Gen Z, they now account for more consumer spending and I believe that they're now the largest part of the workforce. They're three times more likely to buy from and two times more likely to work for companies whose missions they believe in. So if you don't have a mission, good luck in the future. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the future is gonna be really, really difficult at whatever industry you're in because you won't have people to A, work for you and B, to actually support you from, from, a, from a financial perspective to come and buy your products or services. Yeah, well said. We're gonna have to take a quick break, but for anybody out there who is ever curious and wondering, are people really your company's most valuable asset? Here's a guy that knows what he's talking about and, and walks the walk. Uh, we've gotta take a very quick break. We'll be right back on Behind the Numbers. Don't go anywhere. Burlington County College is now Rowan College at Burlington County. Still the same great faculty. At a community college ranked top 50 in the nation. Basically, we earn more and pay less. RCBC students are accepted at Rowan University after graduation. And get a bachelor's degree for around $30,000. Online and Mount Laurel students get a 15% Rowan University tuition discount. And many scholarship opportunities. So you earn more and pay even less. Rowan College at Burlington County. Your path to success. They are the greatest fighting force the world has ever seen. But what does it take to strengthen our service members? What does it take to let them know that we stand behind them, wherever they are? What does it take to bridge the distance and keep them connected to family? home and country, and what does it take to prepare them for their future when their service to the nation is complete? What does it take to strengthen our service members so they can be the greatest force for good in the world? It takes a force. Be a force behind the forces. Share a message today at force.uso.org. A big house. How do I look? Do, do I look good? I want to play hard. The nails done. Once a month. I want. I want. I want a home. I just want a home. I want someone to love. Last year, more than 30,000 companion animals came to us without homes. 20,000 of them were felines. Let's make some homes together. Choosing Medicare coverage can be a very confusing and complicated process. Help is just a phone call away, 856-226-4800. As a licensed insurance agent, I'll assist you in making an informed and confident decision on a Medicare plan that meets your needs, lifestyle, and budget. Call me today for a free, no obligation, Medicare benefits consultation, 856-226-4800. Built for fun. Legendary rock and roll cars. Yeah, we do it. Casinos by the ocean. Now that's New Jersey. 100 
30 miles of beautiful beaches, solid rock, and everything in between. Now that's New Jersey. Burlington County College. It's now Rowan College in Burlington County. Still the same great faculty. At a community college ranked top 50 in the nation. Basically, we earn more and pay less. RCBC students are accepted at Rowan University after graduation and get a bachelor's degree for around $30,000. Online and Mount Laurel students get a 15% Rowan University tuition discount. And a many scholarship opportunities. So you earn more and pay even less. Rowan College, Burlington County. Your path to success. They are the greatest fighting force the world has ever seen. But what does it take to strengthen our service members? What does it take to let them know that we stand behind them, wherever they are? What does it take to bridge the distance and keep them connected to family and home? Hi everyone, welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder. My guest today is Nick Bayer of Saxby's, the CEO. And uh, this is the part of the program that we call the bottom line, where our guest gets to offer their key takeaway. So if anyone's just joining us, Nick, what would be your key takeaway for the audience? You know, there have been a lot of lessons learned for me in, in this entrepreneurial journey. Um, but I think what I feel so grounded to and so connected to right now is this, in, this idea of being a double impact company. You know, whether you're in the hospitality business, you're in insurance, you're in accounting or any business in between, I believe that we're at a, a tipping point from, from a capitalism perspective where businesses don't, don't just sort of have to be from a nicety perspective, from a necessity perspective, businesses need to stand for more than just making money. Making money is important you know, for a for-profit business and with shareholders and your people being paid well, but we have to also be as committed to making money as we are to social impact or, or to you know, societal impact or environmental impact because yeah, it's what we need right now. I mean, we, we have a lot of strife in this world right now. We have a lot of competition from a business perspective, whether it be East versus West, you know, like there's just a lot of challenges. But more importantly, the talent that has been growing up over the last 35 years are growing up expecting that of not only the companies that they're going to work for, but of the brands that they want to be able to support. So I think that we are really at this tipping point where businesses need to reevaluate what they stand for, what is their why, what's the why people are going to come to you or, or work for your business and ensure that a so societal impact is built into the core of who you are as a business. Yeah, you've done a great job aligning your brand and culture. And let's just go a little bit deeper into something that you alluded to in the first segment, that's mm -hmm. experiential learning. Yeah. So you give your employees an opportunity to become CEOs, yep. cafe executive officers. Yep. Talk a little bit about that program. Yeah, so, so every single Saxby's is run by a CEO, um, which when, when he first sort of floated this idea, there weren't a lot of people who loved the idea. They're like, Nick, there's only one CEO in a company. This is the way that people do it. And that just made me want to do it that much more. You know, that I wanted the business to, to be different than the way other people do. Like, I, I don't believe in the idea that like everybody works up for a CEO, especially me being the CEO of the company. I didn't want this business to be about me. And, and the second thing was, is again, going back to my parents' story, like, I don't know why a human being would just want to be a cog in a wheel. I don't know why they would just want to be a number in a workforce. I just genuinely believe that people want more of themselves. And when you can empower people and they can feel like they've got the training, the support, and the ability to be able to make decisions and be entrepreneurial, I think you get the best out of people. And so, you know, we destroyed our, what we were then franchising, and then we had this cafe manager program. Where I felt like it was a very robotic role. I'm like, you know what? These are going to be CEO roles. And exactly what my job is, I, you know, we're private equity backed, I have a board that I report to, I have a great management team, all the, the, ta the blocking and tackling that I have as a CEO of Saxby's, we're going to put the same thing on our, on our CEOs, our cafe executive officers. And so we launched that program about you know, over three years ago. And the quality of talent we get, the retention that we have of that program, and more importantly, the, the happiness and the output we're getting from that has been immense. And the CEO program really sort of opened our eyes to like another new innovation that we could create, which was our experiential learning program. 
where I've been, I've been fortunate to be guest lecturing and an entrepreneur in residence or an executive in residence at a lot of great universities like Drexel and Temple and Cornell and Wharton. And I started to see this huge tipping point, unlike when I was in school, where entrepreneurship was a word that nobody uttered in higher ed. You know, like it wasn't something that was taught in higher ed. The pendulum swung all the way to the other side. Now, entrepreneurship is what everybody wanted to teach. It's what universities were raising money based on. They were creating all these big entrepreneurship centers. But in the pedagogy of higher ed, there was this thing called experiential learning that everybody was really struggling with. You know, how do we, you know, every, every university, I mean, whether I'm on the board of Community College of Philadelphia or Harvard or everywhere in between, everyone's teaching the classroom portion of entrepreneurship pretty well. How do you write a business plan? How do you write a company culture? How do you find partnerships and raise money? They're teaching all that really well. What's the hardest part of running a business, though? It's managing people, it's dealing with competition, it's understanding a profit and loss statement, and experiential learning is meant to sort of bind those two things together. But I think that there was a, a great need for industry, like people like myself, people like yourself, to be able to come together and partner with higher ed to truly be able to create experiential learning. And so in 2015, I presented this idea to the incredibly innovative uh, leader who runs Jackson University named John Fry. And I went to John, they had just created a standalone school of, of entrepreneurship called the Closed School of Entrepreneurship. I said, John, I truly believe that all the moving parts that go into running a bustling Saxby's, which are being done by CEOs, are all the, the three pillars, as we call them, that go into running any business. And I believe that 18 to 22 year olds can do this. I think that, that we can create experiential learning through this. And John, yeah, the, the best validation I could possibly get was John Fry telling me, Nick, I think you're onto something, Let, let's do something about that. So April 13th, 2015, we debuted our experiential learning program in partnership with Drexel. Nice, great program, uh, and I'm a Drexel alum, by the way. I've got my MBA from Drexel in finance. It's an amazing place. So what's uh, in store in the future for Saxby's? I think you've got some interesting things that are, that are in the pipeline here. Tell us a little bit about that if you can. Yeah, we really do. You know, like I, I, I wish I could say that I had greater vision that when we debuted this, this program on April 13th of 2015, that it was gonna be this huge thing for us. But I didn't, you know, I thought it was a really great opportunity where we could sort of put together our strengths at Saxby's, where we, we allow entrepreneurs the opportunity to, to run their own businesses and be able to provide this great need and service, synergistic service to, to higher ed. But the day that we opened this cafe, and it's exclusively student designed, the facade of the coffee bar is graffitied by Westfall College of Art students, all the art, is, there's hand-painted murals. I mean, it is the coolest cafe, and it's exclusively run by a team of 45 students. And the day that we opened, John and I took celebratory espresso shots, and he walked outside with me, and he said, Nick, this needs to be everywhere. This program needs to be scaled. We, we need to be able to provide ROI to parents, to students, to financial aid servicers that we've not been able to provide up to this point with experiential learning. And so we've worked really hard to scale that program, and now we've got incredible partnerships with places like Millersville University, Temple University, LaSalle University, St. Joseph's University, Westchester University, Penn State University. So we've grown this experiential learning program. We now have hundreds of college students running their own business 24-7, 365, coming in our office every single month and presenting their profit and loss statements. And they're not only getting wages and bonuses, they're getting full academic credit for doing this as well. It's a really big innovation, and I give all of those universities incredible credit for stepping out of the comfort zone of what higher ed is normally look like yeah. and partnered with, an, with a, an, an, a company like Saxby's to do this. And one of the things I realized when I speak to the presidents of those universities and I speak to the leaders of those universities and the professors of those, those universities is, it's one thing that we have this innovative program, but it's another thing that we bring a unique and difference making culture to the university. That's yeah. a big part of what they're looking for is that Saxby stands for something. They know that their young people are not only going to be taken care of, and treated and supported well, they're gonna love what they do. And that the work that they're doing is actually difference making. I think that that's a big thing that I've realized, like it's culture coming back to the forefront of being so important in, in what we're doing. So a lot of our future looks like continuing to scale out this experiential learning program. And then just literally this week, we signed a lease to be able to build a roastery, a beautiful roastery wow. here in Philadelphia. And so we've hired a great team of, of coffee experts. Um, I've already been to South America and, and Central America a couple of times myself on, on coffee videos. buying trips. Like it's, been, it's been really amazing. And so we're really starting to refocus our business on the product side. And so not only vertically integrating our business, but more importantly, reinvesting in our people. We have 750 people who want to know more about coffee. They want to cup Costa Rican coffees and understand the difference between Indonesian coffees and, then, and be able to talk to our guests 
you know, our thousands of people that are loyal to our brand, they want to be able to share this experience of, of coffee with them. And so that's th those two things are really big steps forward for Saxby's in 2019. Awesome. Looking forward to that. We only have a couple of minutes left. When you talk about the brand, one of the components of the brand is your logo. Yep. And I know you recently redesigned that. Can you talk a little bit about the redesign? Yeah. You know, when I was starting Saxby's, I, I knew nothing about everything. Um, you know, I was starting pretty much from scratch. And the Saxby's logo back then was probably one step above clip art. You know, well, there, was nothing, there was nothing cool about it. It was, um, the company's name at the time was Saxby's Coffee. It had this like fake steam coming out of this little generic coffee cup. It was this faded maroon was our color. It worked for a bunch of years, you know, but I, I remember one day I was sitting in our headquarters in, in Center City, Philadelphia with this awesome like converted warehouse space. It's always playing cool music with great people running around and coffee bar in it. And I kept looking up at the circular logo and I finally, I said to, to our VP of operations, I'm like, this might sound ridiculous, but I really despise our logo. Like, I, I'm really tired of looking at that logo. I think it, who we've become as a business is so much more advanced than what our, our logo um, was. And so we hired these really, really smart marketing consultants to be able to come in and be like, Nick, you're either crazy, like the logo's amazing and people love it, or let's advance it as well. And, and they went out and did a lot of focus grouping of our team members, our guests, the community. And you know, they came back and said, yeah, your, your logo is pretty mundane and it does not do what all the interesting things that you guys are doing any justice. And so the recommendations where you drop coffee from the name, Saxby stands for so much more than just great coffee. And the colors need to be as vibrant as the experience is when you, when you go into a Saxby's. And so we yeah, brought on this like fire engine red, the sky blue, like this really awesome matte black. And like everything just sort of lifted. And in April of 2017, literally like overnight, like a, our team was like a bunch of elves. Every single sign, every single cup, every single touch point of Saxby's changed to that. And almost two years later, Dave, I'm amazed at how many people reach out to me on social media or just you know, via email or phone calls and be like, your logo makes me smile. You know, it's this stylized hot air balloon. And like, it makes me smile. Like a hot air balloon puts a smile on my face. And like, it's such great branding because when I think of Saxby's, I think of like happy, friendly people who are making a difference in the world. And that's great branding. You know, it's great branding when the logo fits with what the business is. No question about it. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. This went so fast. Goes too quickly. I, I, I can't thank you enough for being our guest today on Behind the Numbers. Uh, again, my guest today was Nick Baer, CEO of Saxby's. I'm Dave Bookbinder. And we'll see you next time on Behind the Numbers. Take care.